The old man of the sea, Proteus, is a struggle. He could reveal the will of the gods and prophesy, but you had to tie him down first. And you had to ignore all the different shapes he took, even if they did scare the hell out of you. That's what it was like for me as I looked into the history of my race. I knew from my DNA that I was Cretan, and in the beginning I stuck with Crete and the area surrounding Crete, obviously. But after a while, it became obvious to me that the men on that island are a big node in a DNA network that stretches from Pakistan all the way to Portugal, and from there into the New World. More than once, we'd sink down roots and start from scratch and build a new civilization that didn't look like anything that had come before. It's happening right now in southern Pakistan, although I doubt the people there will succeed. They've got too many enemies, and God help them, they're sitting on top of a bunch of natural resources. Sometimes we'd even scare the hell out of each other march out to fight foreign wars that in many respects were actually civil wars, like every time the Romans went at it with the Parthians, or the blood feud between the Republic of Venice and the Byzantine Empire, or Venice's 400-year occupation of Crete. Here in the West, Crete was a breathing space, lasted about 2,000 years, that let us solidify our position as a freestanding race, before moving on to bigger and better things, all unknown by historians and unseen by our greatest fans until the DNA started rolling in. Hence, the children of Proteus. One thing I want you to keep in mind as I work through this series is the idea of the extended phenotype. We are shapeshifters, but we do have a signature. The extended phenotype was an idea introduced by the English evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins. Here's how it works. A phenotype is how an animal expresses its genes, its genotype, and its body. Does it have legs? Does it have wings? What kind of proteins does it make? The extended phenotype captures behavior. And in our case, I want you to keep in mind one of Dawkins' most interesting examples of the extended phenotype, a beaver and its dam. So when I talk about what we do and what we've been doing since the Stone Age, I want you to think about that dam. Because like the beaver, we do what we do because we're built to do it and called to do it. I had no idea my people were so accomplished. I myself am not an important person. I'm from a family of nobodies. I just wanted to know what the hell I was. I remember the first time I felt, filled out a racial questionnaire when I was in elementary school. I had to call the teacher over because I didn't really know what to put. She finally just told me to go ahead and put white. Later in the Navy, I got in an argument with a black guy. Why don't you call yourself Hispanic? Well, I'm not Hispanic. Well, you're not white either. We went back and forth on that for a while. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. But after a while, I realized he accused me of being a snob. I'm too good to call myself Hispanic. So when I go to college, I say I'm Hispanic, and I end up winning an award for top Hispanic student. And I go up and I say, listen, I'm not really Hispanic. And he says, it doesn't really matter. So, and it was nice. I went ahead and went to the banquet, and I took my mom. And she's like, well, why, why are you winning an award for top Hispanic? You know, won't happen again. So as you can see, there was some crazy town here with this. Now, here's how this series and... My last series on the Festus disc got started. I'm reading about the Minoans on Crete, and I think, these people remind me of the Romans. Could the Romans be from Crete? Mostly because they were so damn competent. Everything they did, they did well. Kind of like the Romans. Except they didn't look anything like the Romans. The children of Proteus? This is when I got my first lesson. But I blew that idea off because I knew just enough Roman history to be dangerous. I thought the Romans were wild barbarians who desperately needed the help of their more sophisticated and civilized neighbors to the north, the Etruscans, if they have any hope of making a city like Rome work. But then I reviewed the myth, and I saw that the twins Romulus and Remus were the grandsons of a king of a city. So the Romans claim to have always been civilized, which is exactly what my point is. I got tripped up by what I called their Etruscan complex. They were always giving the Etruscans more credit than they deserve. The paradoxical conclusion is that, so far from attempting to minimize or conceal Etruscan influence on early Rome, our sources are actually guilty of the opposite tendency, and have, if anything, exaggerated the extent of this influence. Here's an example from architecture, something that we just knew was true because the Romans told us. Turns out to not be true at all. As far as the Tuscanic temple is concerned, there's good reason to think that it was first developed in Rome, where the earliest examples have been found. Tuscanic probably means Etruscan, 
but Marcus Vitruvius Polio may have fallen victim to a tendency, prevalent in his time, to regard as Etruscan anything venerable or archaic. Alternatively, he could have been misled by his Greek sources. Given that down to the 3rd century, Greek writers referred to all the native inhabitants of peninsular Italy indiscriminately as Tyrrhenians, Etruscans, as Dionysius of Halicarnassus perceptively observed. A Greek writer would not think twice about calling an Italic temple Tyrrhenian. Now, just like the Israelites and the Phoenicians and the Philistines in the East, the Greeks thought all the Italians looked alike. Now, before we go on with my case, let's have a quick survey of what the latest archaeological research in archaic Italian history is now telling us. It will strongly support my thesis that the Romans are largely settlers from Crete. They were civilized from day one, which is exactly what the Romans themselves said. In addition, during the Final Bronze Age, there is an acceleration and intensification of settlement stabilization and selection, with a preference for locations on hilltops and small plateaux. At the same time, an integrated and complementary economic specialization between agricultural activities practiced in the central Italian lowlands and seasonal pastoralism restricted mainly to the Apennine highlands, which would continue into historical times, are fully realized. Notice the distinction between the agricultural lowlands and the pastoral highlands. The agricultural people are the more advanced and largely represent the Cretan settlers in this scenario. The highlands are still dominated by the people who were living there when we started pouring in. Later I'm going to show we were integrating these original Italians, almost from day one, but that process was interrupted by history and forgotten until today. I'm going to finish this intro with a nice show of support for my assumption that the Romans were not passive receivers of culture from the East. The last 30 years of archaeology have flipped that on its head. Rome was the engine that pulled the Mediterranean to the peak of high civilization. And as I'm going to prove in this series, we were lightning that struck twice. By highlighting these early local and autochthonous developments leading to a higher complexity, this work will challenge the traditional diffusionist theory and will demonstrate that urbanization and state formation in Middle Tyrrhenian Italy were probably entangled with, but certainly not triggered by, external influences from the Eastern Mediterranean.